That's right. Oh, here we go. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Analyzing Stories. How to Analyze Stories. That's what we're talking about today. And I am joined by the nemesis who has no elbow patches, Dr. A.P. Canavan, a critical dragon, otherwise known as Professor Fireballs. Hello, A.P., how are you? <laughs> why, why are you so mean to me, Philip? <laughs> oh, no, no. Why? <laughs> Look what he's doing, everyone. Don't believe it. It's, nefarious. it's a nefarious plot to get your sympathy. Yeah. I see the number. Hang on a sec. The number of times you have done evil plans you have laughed evilly about all of these things <laughs> and then still still to this day point the finger at me the innocent victim in all of this <laughs> and say that i'm the evil one you despicable dastardly yeah and other words beginning with d person yeah. that's exactly what the nefarious villains do they make they try to make pretend that they're the uh, the the victims, yeah. So evidence, no elbow patches. So I'm <laughs> surprised that your screen is so bright, given the amount of gas lights that are there. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, we are here to talk about what are we talking about? Oh, setting, setting. Yes, we're talking about setting. Last time we talked about character, that video was on a critical dragon. Be sure to check that out. I think it was a really fun and hopefully insightful discussion. We are trading back and forth with these videos, so make sure you catch all the good ones over at a critical dragon. And you should subscribe to his channel, I guess, while you're there, even though he's my nemesis. Uh, he, he has some good stuff. He has some interesting content, especially the videos where I am there too, but you know. You condescending. <laughs> <laughs> sitting there with your 30 30 x thousand subscribe take pity on the poor little oh go and so give him a pity subscription oh no <laughs> no this you're is so mean there. critical dragon like and subscribe <laughs> <laughs> all right well setting we are talking about setting so i'm going to start out by throwing out a few important elements of setting AP. And uh, we're gonna give some more specifics in terms of defining setting first, and then maybe give some examples of some of our favorite stories where we feel that setting plays a critical role, where setting is uh, uh, such an important element that if you were doing an analysis, a review, you'd wanna probably bring it up, that it is very much related to the overarching theme of the story and that it is one of those elements that ties things together. Now, now it's true that not always is the setting that important, but there are some stories where setting is so vital, so crucial, it changes the characters. It, it is such a uh, monumental part of the story. So, but be beginning though, with what is setting and sometimes the most obvious answer is it's where the story happens. And that is definitely one element of setting. It is the locale, as it were, local with an E on the end, locale. Uh, but it, that's just the place. Setting also includes the time period. That can be important as well when we're talking about, you know, if we're, if we're talking about Jack London's To Build a Fire, for example, where the setting is really important. Now, where it happens in the Yukon, this frozen otherworldly wilderness that is uh, a, a situation where, where you'd have to be very well equipped to survive even. But it's also the time period that's important. It's in the late 1890s. What was happening up there in the late 1890s? The gold rush. Why is that important? Well, it might tell you a little bit about the character's motivations for being there in the first place. So knowing the, the, the time period can also be important, or the in the case of many fantasies, the time period that the story is based on uh, can be informative as well. Sometimes, oh, I, I love that. Uh, well, uh, uh, one tiny quibble there. Yes, it's not necessarily the time period the story is based on because it's not historical fiction. Mm -hmm. The time period that the fantasy is evoking or is inspired uh, by. Yes, okay, that's a better way to put it. Better way to put it. Yes, and that can do with levels of technology. It can yeah. do with, so. I agree with your point. It's just yeah. when we say things like based on, people go, oh, well, 
that's not what happened in the in this particular time period in our history and you go yeah and that's a different planet it's yeah. a secondary world it's not our history it's taking elements from it to create an evocation of a sense of a the past right right and so Good when point. you were talking there you pointed out a really interesting distinction between a geographical setting and a temporal setting right just to add in those words to, to help us instead of just going setting when we think of temporal uh the time period when we think of geographic we're talking about the physical and why this can sometimes be really interesting most fantasy readers today are very familiar with the concept of a secondary world yes but if you go back in literary history even 19th century it was far more common to find lost land tales mm. and hollow earth stories and uh, you know a strange island that has been found and what the function of that was doing is essentially what a secondary world does by either separating out the temporal distance between the perceived mundane world and a different time period where different times evolve differently that creates that distinction almost like a threshold between the two realities we see it again with fairy the idea that you're in the mundane world you cross a threshold into the magical world yeah but if we think of how we explored the world and in modern society you know you can go on google earth and just go and look at places the idea of setting a strange lost land tale in today's world can strain our willing suspension of disbelief because we'd have discovered it by now. And if we had a hollow earth story, we'd be going, yeah, but the earth isn't hollow. <laughs> um, and again, it strains our disbelief. But if we think of the function that those things did, it was creating a fantastical reality where the assumed mundane or real rules of the world are different and so uh, the barzoom stories go to mars why go to mars because it allows for the creation of a wholly new society and and interesting things now we sort of go yeah but if you set it on mars um th those things aren't there so again willing suspension of disbelief is harder to maintain but if we say oh it's a completely different world it gives us that excuse and that's one of the things that setting does which can be absolutely fascinating because it addresses the the reader response in this form of willing suspension of disbelief and the ability to set aside our preconceptions about what this world is our history our norms mm. to engage with this fictional setting where those norms cannot necessarily be assumed yeah brilliant point yeah and the uh, gulliver's travels might be an early example of the kind of thing that you were referring to where that was a period of exploration and people didn't know much about different parts of the world and so you know an author could get away with uh pretending that there's this island out there and many people actually believed that what was written in gulliver's travels was actually real apparently at, at the time that they thought this wasn't just some made up thing that it was one of those travel narratives about the explorers finding new islands and, and such uh so and you have a homer's odyssey uh yeah. lucian's true history that yeah. you know yeah. these stories of going to a far off land and experiencing something radically different you can see how uh, and the temporal change you know acts in much the same way um Stephen Erickson disagrees with me about this, which is fine. We, we don't agree on everything. But for me, Hard's Hyborian age, the Conan stories, a lot of those stories that are interlinked, that is set back in a fictionalized form of Earth's history. Right. But that temporal setting, for me, mechanically works the same way as if it had been a secondary world. Because although it is purported to be an ancient history, yeah, the distance between where we are now reading it and the societal and civilized and, and base norms cultural norms uh, that are explored in the text that distinction between those two things allows us to think of it as a separate reality mm. and therefore the suspension disbelief in that fictive reality that's 
that's where I come from on that. And uh, I think I don't want to put words in Erickson's mouth. Oh, let's but do I it. Think, He's not even here. We let's do it. <laughs> but he likes. I think he thinks of it as a continuity of Earth's history, a way of exploring uh -huh. how we evolved. So he sees it as deeply connected, as an explanation of how we ended up where we are. And again different approaches to reading it and understanding the thing in front of us. It's not that there's one way of doing this, that yeah. this is the one way that you must do it. It's all about finding ways to conceptualize and understand the thing. And for me, understanding that separation, be it through time or through space, hmm. is really, really useful in understanding the function of the setting. I suppose it's even possible that an author, I was just talking about Gulliver's Travels, you could apply the same to the Conan stories, really, and say that the, during one period of time, uh, say close to the time when the, the work was written, the understanding was that it was more quote unquote real world. Whereas as uh, time goes by, we recognize that it's so you know uh, fictionalized that um, we can conceive of it as a secondary world rather. Um, but, and, you know, you can see, take the same story and look at it through different lenses, I guess, depending on where you're standing from. Um, uh, one of the really weird things about Gulliver's Travels, it was initially an adult satire. Yes, yes. And somehow and now, it's a children's so many, book. <laughs> so many people think of it as a children's book and you're like, no, not really. And you know what Gulliver makes those gloves out of? Uh, um and his uh, shoes yeah yeah we don't want to get into that let, let, let's just gloss over that yeah <laughs> so anyway uh that one other element to yeah. setting so we talked about place we talked about time a bit uh and we're going to give more examples but another really important element of setting when you're trying to grasp it when you're trying to analyze it i would say is atmosphere which is the least, okay, time, that's easy. We can identify the time or the period from real world history that it was inspired by or something of that nature. Um, or we can identify the place. Uh, that's usually not that difficult. But atmosphere, it's an important element of setting. And it is uh, something that is very often uh, a, a big part of the story, and many of the stories that I love, for example, the Dark Tower series, the atmosphere is really important. And many of Ian Esselmont's books, you talked about uh, Blood and Bone in our previous discussion. Great example of where it's the, at, it's the atmosphere. And one of the things that I think Esselmont is brilliant at, one of the best writers out there, is in terms of establishing atmosphere. That's an element of setting. So what do you want to say about atmosphere, AP, as, as a, an important part of setting? Um, and um, atmosphere is interesting because there's clearly a very significant overlap with style. Yeah. And then, then we're getting into a very nebulous discussion. But if we think about um, someone staying in a stately home, and you, so the, the old English countryside and you have this beautiful stately home. You go, right, so there's the setting. But there's a significant difference in a gothic ghost story where that stately home feels haunted and dark mm. and frightening and sinister or a restoration uh, romance like Jane Austen where oh it's full of lights and they go dancing and they play cards the the mm. physical setting and even the time period could be identical but the atmosphere changes mm. that place radically in how we perceive it how we react to it and that can impact character action. So we can see that the atmosphere generated is an additional element that adds to our interpretation of setting. If um, someone is in the desert and they've been crawling through the desert and they are dying of thirst and they come to this oasis that has a puddle of muddy water in it they feel that this is a boon, a relief. This is going to save their life. And they, you know, they'll dip their head into the muddy water and they'll drink it down, even though it's like gross and disgusting. But to them, it's not. Take the same thing of where someone has been magically transported, that they were in a lush forest and frolicking around, having a great time, and they're dumped into that same oasis. Mm. The character perception of it is going to be radically, they're like, why am I in this barren land, even though they are now standing in the middle of what the other character thought was 
fertile and life-saving. They're seeing it as deserted, all because of how they feel about the location. And that feeling, that is part of what atmosphere is. There's the atmosphere evoked by the author, but there's also the perception of the thing by the reader. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, so let's talk about some stories where setting is vital, where it's crucial. I mentioned uh, Jack London's story to build a fire a moment ago. Uh, a, 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 an equivalent for me in fantasy would be the wall in A Song of Ice and Fire, where that wall, that end, which could not actually exist in, in, in our world as we know it, uh, but nevertheless, such a it's such a uh, evocative uh, and not just in terms of its physicality, but also its symbolism and the separation between these peoples and also the magic that is somehow imbued in it. Uh, what an, an effective, really wonderfully realized setting. And it plays a huge role in the narrative, doesn't it? Uh, I think that's a great example of a story or another one might be totally different setting. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Totally different setting, but, and, and you can see how important setting can be in a story like Dune, for example, Arrakis. I mean, a big part for me of the appeal of the story of Dune is, is what Frank Herbert realizes with this desert planet and how he brings out so many important themes by making that setting what it is, how he creates the idea of scarcity when it comes to water, but also the analogy between spice and oil in our world, right? Uh, and it's a really effective use of a setting in order to forward so many elements of the story and, and even the character arcs are so intricately tied into that setting in that case, in, in the case of Dune, in the case of the wall in A Song of Ice and Fire. And one of the things that Herbert's Dune did so effectively was how the setting actually shapes and influences culture and society mm. and mm. character and how behaviors and beliefs can be shaped by the landscape that they inhabit. Because when we think of the Fremen and their attitude to water, their attitude to their dead, because of how precious water is in that environment, how they treat their dead is radically different to what we would think of as a normal approach to it. Right. And it, it is both alienating in that we go, these strange others, but at the same time, it is so intrinsically linked to a very logical and rational uh, extension of setting that it makes it believable it makes it easier to suspend our disbelief and the the desert setting was into there's a book and it was miller is it elizabeth miller i can't remember but uh in her story there is a a desert setting and it was so wonderfully evocative it wasn't it wasn't one of those ones where you kind of looked at it and went this is basically just an author describing a beach mm. that sometimes when authors deploy a setting that they are unfamiliar with, it, it doesn't feel as lived in. It doesn't feel as deep. It doesn't feel as wow. rich. And Miller in her work evoked this. You could almost feel the dryness in your mouth reading this, that it was so evocative and it was a stunning bit of writing. And that's, that's what I love when authors really engage with understanding the setting that they have placed these characters in and understand that how characters move around is going to change yeah. according yeah. to their setting, how they, what they believe, how they move, how they think that can all change. And you get that element of authenticity to the world, mm. depth to the world that it's not just a paper it's not just like in a theater the scenery that is on the stage where you know it's symbolically representing something but it is literally paper thin authors who understand the depth of their setting and that doesn't mean they have to go into it, like a lot of detail it can still be incredibly evocative if they create that illusion of three-dimensionality yeah. of that illusion of depth and that can be a really wonderful thing. It's not just 
here's this really cool thing. You go, right, well, that really cool thing has been happening for hundreds of thousands of years. Why have none of the characters ever adapted? Why is the civilization never adapted? Why, why is this not part? It's just a, a surface level sketch. Mm. And it feels very much like the background scenery on a stage rather than a world that feels lived in. And that can be a really interesting uh, distinction between different, particularly even with secondary worlds. But just because something is that sort of thin veneer doesn't necessarily make it bad. It depends right. on the type of narrative. It depends on what the author is trying to evoke. And just because it isn't incredibly deep and evocative doesn't necessarily mean that it's not fulfilling its function. Mm. Because again, setting is part of the functionality of narrative. Exactly. Exactly right. You can even have an author who will use a very similar or even identical setting, but depending on the way the author characterizes that setting, it can perform a different function. For example, J.R.R. Tolkien in The Hobbit gives us Mirkwood, a forest that is dark and threatening and the characters feel very small and vulnerable and uh, they feel separate from nature there where nature is a threat uh, that is outside of them. And it is a place where your survival is in question. Lothlorien in Lord of the Rings, also a forest, also with some very vast powers within it, but it's a very different vibe going on in Lothlorien as opposed to Mirkwood. And that's a that's a different use of that setting in that case, isn't there? Uh, where this, it's more ethereal and beautiful and Tolkien is trying to evoke the, the sorrow of the elves who are fading from Middle Earth and the uh, the depth and the richness of their history and all of that is wrapped up in that. Uh, I, I find it really fascinating how that same author can portray a similar setting, but depending on how they're, you can see what they're what they're trying to do with that setting. You know, there's, there's a different narrative function, isn't there? And and it ties back into what you were saying about atmosphere. The atmosphere of Lothlorien is radically different. To the atmosphere of Markwood, um, but even like when the uh, when the hobbits meet Bombadil, mm. Bombadil's uh, Bombadil's glade and uh, with uh, Goldberry, like all of that, we we see it's the same place. Moments ago, they were kind of they, it felt oppressive and scary, and oh, then yeah, Bombadil well, uh, comes along yeah. with his singing. <laughs> Hey, no, no Bombadil hate around here now. <laughs> um, but he comes on and suddenly the atmosphere shifts. The atmosphere, because the atmosphere shifts, the setting changes. Mm. And, you know, that is one of those wonderful things where you notice that transitionary moment where the same physical location, because of something else happening, that it suddenly feels different. And that... It, it's wonderful. But I, I was thinking that sometimes setting um, setting can have a, a very different effect on it. If you think of Neil Gaiman's American Gods, ah. and you know that traveling around small town, um, like a lot of it, it was in the Midwest, yeah, like small Wisconsin. town America. Yeah. Could you transpose that to England? well the whole concept like the road trip is so american you know uh i feel it's so tied to americana you know baseball apple pie road trip all that yeah and the myth of america yes and yes that is that is at the heart of a lot of what gaiman is exploring in that that those folk tales that are evoked and a given life in american gods there are very different folk tales in England, but it just, you couldn't simply just transpose it. It, it would require significant reworking and yeah. changing and the atmosphere of a lot of the things would have to change and the stories would, it just, it wouldn't work as well yeah. as, a, as a format in a UK setting, but it seems perfectly suited to that American road trip. Yeah, and so central to that also is th that setting is the whole concept and theme of immigration. Uh, and that is a 
not unique to the United States, but it is a big part of American identity. And it is a reason why I think Gaiman is exploring. And you have all those wonderful little interludes, but also the, the idea of these gods were brought here by people from other places, right? And what did they bring with them? And what did how did this place change those gods and these people? Uh, really fascinating. And, and uh, you're absolutely right. Brilliant use of setting to forward some of the themes that Gaiman is exploring in there, which is, it's a story about identity, uh, both national identity and individual identity uh, in, a, in a country that is not always easy to, to figure oneself out in. <laughs> oh, I just want to mention, I think the book I was referring to earlier is Karen Miller's Empress. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I may have to double check that. I'll send you a message and you can put it in a comment, but I think it was Karen Miller's Empress. Okay. But my my memory is shockingly bad sometimes. You know why? Because you just have so many stories that are crammed in there that there's no way to keep them all filed away exactly, right? So, yeah. So. Um, but we, we were going to talk about sort of setting as related to world building. Yes, let's, uh, let's segue to that now. What's the difference, AP, between setting and world building? How, how do you go about defining world building? No, I... I admit, how I think about it is how I think about it. But world building to me is the evocation of setting in the mind of the reader. Mm. So if you've chosen London as the setting and you have your characters moving around doing things and a, uh, the hansom cab goes by, the, the sort of the classical black taxi of London goes by, that evokes London. It's symbolic of London. It is tied to London. That's a little detail about the world. You have built out that world to make it like London. Mm. If you transposed it to New York, you wouldn't have the black taxi go by. You would have the yellow taxi go by. And that suddenly is more evocative of New York, even if you haven't really been again, it, both big urban centers, both big uh, buildings and lots of people walking around a lot of what's being discussed, they both have underground systems and the, the subway. There's so much that would link the two. But in using a detail, like the, the taxi, that suddenly is evocative of a very distinct place. It has built out the world. And that is, because I know a lot of people, when they think of world building, they think, well, first I'm going to create a planet and then I'm going to put, and they think of it as that activity before the narrative. Right. of creating things and certainly like that is an aspect of world building but world building in narrative is making the setting seem authentic and real in the mind of the reader building the world the diegetic reality story world building that world in the mind of the reader that to me is world building yeah. little details about the type of currency offhand remarks that aren't explained, that just drop a reference about the wider world the story is in. It doesn't need explored. It doesn't need explained. But it gives a sense that this is happening in a place, not in, here's a locale surrounded by a white space. Right. That, to me, is what world building is. Um, although I know other people have different definitions. Well, I love that definition myself. And when I think about fantasy as a genre and how important world building is to many of us who read, not all, but there are people who, who aren't as invested in that, but many of us who read fantasy love the world building that goes on. And some of my favorite series, uh, to, to name a few, of course, the, the Malazan authors, uh, Stephen Erickson and Ian Esselmont have created some an incredible world uh, together. Planet Wu, as it sometimes is referred to, uh, or you could look at you know, some of the, the authors who are known for the big world building, Brandon Sanderson's Stormlight Archive, for example, or Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series. There's some just elaborate, there's cultures, there's dress, there's languages, there's all these. Tolkien is always held up as a brilliant, uh, you know, one of the uh, maybe in, inspirational figures in terms of making world building such a central part of what uh, many people think of when they think of fantasy. Jenny Wirtz is, a, is an author that we're in the midst of reading her Wars of Light and Shadow. I think that's a wonderful example of where world building is a crucial part 
of how the the narrative is unfolding in this series. Now, neither of us has finished the series yet, but it's obvious how as we're progressing from book to book, Athera is where the most of the the uh, story is taking place. Uh, but this is a uh, just a brilliantly realized place where the the, the groundedness of it, the earthiness of it, uh, is such an important part of the message of the themes being explored, and the detail put into this, the immersiveness of it is just incredible. Uh, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, and I think one of the things that we we quite often see in um, let, let's call it weaker fantasy is an author can be very impressed with the really clever thing that they have thought up and so mm -hmm. you're reading a sequence and then suddenly it's and now let me explain this really cool concept that i have thought up and you get paragraph after paragraph of basically an encyclopedia entry you know, that's Ex not exposition let's call it yes yeah, yeah and that's not world building right those are the notes that you put in a notebook so that when your characters are going through, you think, well, this thing exists. How does it affect the characters? Mm. How does it influence the characters? But these long encyclopedic uh, fascinations and ruminations quite frequently interrupt the narrative. They, right. They, right. they disrupt the flow of action and character development and the flow of reading. And for a lot of us, like why a lot of us bought like the the beast tolkien's beastry and the encyclopedia of uh, yeah. the song of uh, song of ice and fire the atlas of middle earth by, yeah yeah you know we're fascinated by these details yeah and that's great but they those details those encyclopedia entries those are notes that create the world in the story the world building has to be done in the narrative yeah. and and that's why sometimes I think people can come up with incredible ideas, but because the ramifications and repercussions of them have not been thought through, because it is not blended into the setting properly and, yeah. and affect how people live, that's where we see it more as that scenery in the background instead of right. a living, breathing reality. And so it's difficult because different readers like different things there are lots of readers who really enjoy that encyclopedic knowledge mm -hmm. I great but there's another whole group of readers who are frustrated when everything stops you go but why not just work in the salient details and imply this hemingway talked about this a lot with the iceberg storytelling method yes. which is sometimes misattributed to a much more modern author but it was hemingway and with that, Hemingway implies the depth of the world, the depth of the narrative. He implies a lot by detailing the very surface level, but underneath what is unsaid, but is still present, that is an aspect of world building. Yeah. It's not that it's a sin to have exposition or how it's pejoratively referred to as info dumping sometimes it can be there i think the question to ask is how does this bit of exposition here forward the story uh, and and if it doesn't then maybe it's interrupting the story in a way that is not conducive to the immersion and as an author that might be something you want to avoid is is booting your character your reader rather out of the story by giving them too much information about now it's cool that you thought about all this it really is uh but sometimes you know it's it's like it's like the when they were making the lord of the rings films you know the i i, I watched the documentaries i'm yes i'm a nerd i watched the documentaries yeah. about how they made right. there are there are things that they had built on that set that we never ever see as as viewers of the film they just wanted to add that stuff to give the actors the feeling that they were in this place, that immersion. If they were to go around with the camera and, and just show you all the little details that they put into this, that would not make a good film, right? Uh, that would that would definitely break the, our immersion of the story. So I think that's what you were kind of saying there, right? Yeah, and if you think like when they arrive in Lothlorien, if Tolkien had then went, right, so Frodo, 
Lothlorien was originally settled, but and you get you would just go, oh, what, what is? Tolkien thought about this, but he thought he had it all figured out. But what goes in there is that evocation of atmosphere. That evocation of atmosphere, the only reason it's, or the major reason it's consistent and distinctive is Tolkien understood the underlying rationale for why it was created. That helped him be consistent with his portrayal of things. Yeah, I think what a, a number of authors mistake is, well, but, but he does explain like the, the story of um, X, Y, or Z. Like We get those sections. Go, yeah, that adds flavor. Yes. But it's done sparingly. It's not every time. Oh, look, here's. Well, originally the dragons did, and then they were doing, and then this happened. And the, we don't get that. That's a separate thing. Those are notes. And Tolkien's legendarium um, and the Tolkien estate has you know, made an entire industry out of publishing and refining a lot of his notes that that really weren't intended to be published and they weren't sure. intended to be seen that way. We're just fascinated by it. Yeah. But world building, it's not just the construction of a world before the narrative. It's the evocation of that world. It's yes. giving that world depth. That that story world is not just a paper thin thing that the um, characters are standing on. And I think something that is is important. M. John Harrison was a, was a bit critical of the encyclopedic impulse that we sometimes see in a lot of fantasy novels. Uh -huh. And it can seem like quite a harsh criticism, but what he, I think, was trying to get at was to paraphrase something you said earlier, the setting and the world should be in service to the narrative. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily at necessary for the story, because remember, we talked about this, yes. but in service to the narrative. The narrative is not just plot. Right. The narrative is not just character. The narrative is not just the setting. The narrative is the um, complex interrelationship between all these things. Yeah. And sometimes the servicing the narrative is deepening the world. Sometimes it is creating a sense of atmosphere mm -hmm. sometimes it is about so we see that when we say service to the narrative we're not talking about oh it moves the plot forward right right no like, it could be the themes no. yeah it could be thematic it could be character based right. the, there are different elements and again applying a reductive or simplistic oh well service to the narrative means it must move the story forward mm -hmm. like that is potentially overly reductive. Right. But, you know, even earlier, I said sometimes these interjections of bold exposition explaining an aspect of the world feels more like an interruption to show off, I've thought about this thing, isn't it cool, rather than thinking about the scene and what is necessary for the scene and evoking the salient details in some way. For instance, someone picking up, uh, you're buying something in a market and then looking at the coin, they go, hang on a sec. What's this triangular thing? Oh, that's a, that's a flerbal dinar uh, from the land of blah, blah, blah. You're like, yeah, and it's worthless here. Give me, give me a silver sovereign, you know. Right. But it, it's a little line drop that implies a wider world and implies something about a shopkeeper trying to pass off dud currency. And, right. you know, suddenly it makes the story come alive it, it enlivens the narrative and that's where i think world building really excels where someone understands the entirety of their story world they mm -hmm. understand how these things move and interlink to one another and find clever ways to deepen that reality for the reader that's just beautifully said and, and that is i think one of the reasons why many of us are attracted to the whole genre of fantasy in the first place is that evocation of a world where we can find ourselves and the uh, immersion that uh, authors can provide us when they do that, that uh, amazing world building that doesn't just give us a sense of place and time, but gives us an atmosphere that we live in, that we breathe as we're in this story. And that is 
big part of the the beauty and the wonder of these stories is that world building. I think that's uh, something that it's not unique to fantasy, but it is something that fantasy in some ways I think has uh, an advantage because it is a genre where the soaring of the imagination is encouraged, where sometimes uh, having a, a setting that with, let's say a, a city in the sky, okay? <laughs> How are you going to do that? You know, how, how does that work? Uh, and uh, involving the suspension of disbelief, uh, but also uh, as a as a as a as a place to bring your reader uh, and somewhere where they can experience that wonder and beauty and and uh, and hopefully um, feel that uh, being there has been a, a transformative journey for them at, along with the characters. Yeah. Ditto. Okay. <laughs> All right. I think we've talked about setting and world building pretty well here. Uh, I'm pretty satisfied. Uh, I, I know we didn't talk about everything, but uh, uh, please, in the comments, uh, feel free to ask your questions. By the way, we are going to uh, also make a video at the end of this series answering questions. So if you do have questions about any of the videos in this series, including this one, uh, please feel free to leave them and, and we intend to address your questions in a kind of a, uh, an, it's not an appendix video necessarily, but uh, a, uh, we'll just make it part a liver? of the, A kidney? I guess one of those organs. Well, it's going to be an awful video. Ooh, 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 ouch. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to do that. So leave us your questions and comments if you have any. Give us your favorite examples of setting and, and world building as well in the comments. But uh, thank you so much for watching. Thank you, AP, for, for being here and uh, putting up with me and uh, sharing your, your, your brilliant insights, which I affectionately refer to as fireballs. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, it is always a pleasure to discuss these things with you, my friend. All right. Well, everybody... Thanks once again, and we'll see you next time over at A Critical Dragon, where we'll be talking about symbols and symbolism and how to discuss symbols as a really important aspect of storytelling. So be prepared with your symbols, not not the kind, you know. With and the drums and other musical instruments. Yeah, okay, I knew that was coming. <laughs> All right, bye everyone. <laughs>